morning. It's very nice to be here. Um, I realize how uh, isolating and lonely it is to be a clergy. It's like I was looking at all your conversations and I wished I was part of your conversations. I'm like sitting here by myself and all having these great conversations. So it's lonely, I'm not gonna lie. So we're not welcoming. <laughs> Very clickish. Uh, it's like click, click, click. <laughs> I saw him tying your shoelaces. I thought this has got to be good. <laughs> what was going on over there? Deacon socks. Deacon socks, all right. And the culture. <laughs> He got up and walked away and just walked off. I mean, it's like very exciting. Um, I was trying to figure out your conversation. I couldn't quite hear it. It's difficult. Um, all right. Um, so I'm supposed to talk about the feeding of the, the multitude today and how that kind of uh, integrates to the self. Wow, everyone's just staring at me. So it's, it's one of those That's things. what happens when you talk to <laughs> You know, it's funny, I have a professor, right? So I teach all the time and like, I'll be teaching and I'll, I'll be like halfway through the semester and I'm teaching a class and I'm halfway through a class and then I'll have this moment like everyone is staring at me. <laughs> and, it's, and it's weird and I'm like, I get nervous all of a sudden like that everyone's staring at me. Okay. Um, so you all know the story of the five loaves and the two fish. I don't need to repeat it uh, to you. Um, and uh, a couple things just to point out in the story is, is the people that followed Christ didn't feel hungry. They listened to him speak and, um, and he was enough, right? Even the basic need of food was unnecessary, right? And then they, you know, it's the afternoon, they're like evening, they're like, oh my God, I'm hungry. And I think this just points to a real important point that is always good for the servants to realize is that, is that sometimes we kind of get a little carried away with um, stuff, right? If we do this, people will come. If we do this, this will attract people. If we do this, this will get the kids engaged, right? And if you look at Christ's ministry, the apostolic ministry, it wasn't that. He just presented himself, right? And that was enough, and that drew the crowds, right? And if you notice in the Gospels, it'll say Jesus was speaking, and there was a crowd around him, right? And so sometimes, you know, even, even in some secular churches, right, say that secular churches um you know you'll see things like bingo night right and you're like bingo's gambling you know and and you 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 got to the point where you're offering bingo you know to get people to come and so you have to be careful not to lose your message and your culture and what it is we are as a church we present christ that's all we do right we don't compete with the world we don't try to out entertain the world we don't try to you know you know compete with what they're doing right they offer the world and we're not going to try to offer the world with a christian twist you know like there's a group to say surfers for jesus you know it's like you just like to surf right that's okay just say i like surfing you don't have to say surfing for jesus but anyway i want to talk about the the five loaves um and when you think about the five loaves you know what's the value of five loaves and these are tiny little loaves of bread and it's not much right um each piece of bread, I mean, five for a kid, right? So it's not much. And yet it turns out each bread fed a thousand people. So it ended up starting worthless almost. And it, it, it started worthless and it ended up invaluable, okay? And then each piece fed a thousand. So how did it do that? How did each loaf go from being worthless to feeding a thousand people? It got placed in the hands of Christ. Okay. And that's the key to blessing. So as servants, we want to feed a thousand people. And we want to be blessing to people. And we are worthless. Right? We are dust. Right? And we, in and of ourselves, have nothing to offer. Right? And the only thing we can offer is to put ourselves in the hand of Christ. And when we do that, then we go from dust, from nothing, to everything. So, this, this and by the way, this idea of blessing, um, just as a side note, it's very important that the blessing we're talking about is not a material blessing. And, and sometimes we reduce religion, and, and I'm, I'm starting to meet a lot of youth now who we're dealing with the consequences of this thinking 
which is we reduce religion to a way to get things on earth, right? Um, you know, if you're really good, you get into medical school, you should pray and then God will bless you. I, you know, all the kids on finals week show up to the early mid, you know, the liturgy because, you know, God's going to be like, oh, you're here at Wednesday liturgy. Oh, in that case, I'll give you an A on OCAM, right? Um, and, and we reduce God to these material blessings, right? And in the Old Testament, that was the way God showed love, right? In fact, you know, he would bless by oxen and sheep and cattle and children and land, right? In fact, you know, after, after they crossed the Jordan, Joshua had a group of people come together whose only job it was to, was to recount all of the things that God had done for them, the blessing, okay? This kind of thinking is very Old Testament thinking. And this is how God showed blessing in the Old Testament. He blessed by abundance, right, by stuff, okay? But then we move to the New Testament and we move from being children to adults, right? And it's kind of like, you know, when, 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 when Tita comes over, right? And she wants to play with the kids. What does Tita do? She gives them chocolate, right? Tita knows how to win this, right? She doesn't have to discipline. She doesn't have to deal with cavities. She doesn't have to deal with anything, right? Tita knows how to win. She just gives chocolate. Kids love Tita, right? Win. Okay, and then you can suck it up and deal with it for the next two months, right? And the kid wants chocolate for breakfast, like he did, you know, two days at Tita's house. And why is that? <laughs> a lot of anger. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what time? She was here. She was here. Yeah. Oh, she's giving some stuff. Giving Tita to give me chocolate. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> What time we used to live in Michigan and, and we came and my 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 mom spoiled the, the, the heck crap out of like my oldest son and then he wouldn't sleep he wouldn't do all this stuff right and I called her from Michigan as he was crying and I put the phone to it and I said listen to what you did you know we used to have this down and now you all messed anyway, this up okay <laughs> let's, just, let's just focus here yeah, right so in the old testament it was about livestock it was about grapes it was about figs it was about all of these things and this was god's blessing and, and like a child right god showed us he was good by giving us chocolate right here i'm going to give you grapes and figs and land and cattle and now in the, in the new testament we're adults Right. And as an adult, you know that just giving a kid chocolate is not good for them. It's not good for their teeth or their health or anything. Right. And so we move from just getting candy to getting meals. Right. It's something more substantial. We eat broccoli, although we don't like it, we know it's better for us. And so we sometimes hold this belief till now. Right. And, and in fact, there's a lot of these traditions, and, and I'm kind of on this, you know, kick. But like, there's a lot of traditions we have that are just kind of like very built into this, like the ned, right? Where, you know, you, 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 you know, you hold some money up to one of us and we say, ah, my kid gets into medical school, then you get this money, right? And then, but first, my kid gets into medical school, right? Then you get the money. You kind of flick it at one of us like this or one of us. And then he gives you the thing and then you give him the money. Transactional, right? That's not a loving father. That's not the relationship that Jesus came to establish. It sounds really strange, right? Um, and so we, we reduce God to that level, right? So the point I want to make here is this idea of being in the hands of God and being a blessing. I'm not talking about material blessing and physical blessing. I get a Lexus and a Tesla and a new house and a kid goes to medical school. And that's not my interaction with God, right? In fact, we know that God challenges his saints, right? And we know that the person who got cancer isn't, they didn't get cancer because they're bad. And the person who got health because he's good, right? Because if we say that, you know, like, you know, when someone has a lot of money, right? Someone in Arabic will say, Rabinim Bereklu, right? What does that mean? It means he has a lot of money. And that means God has blessed him. So the person who doesn't have a lot of money, God has not blessed them. The person who has cancer, God has not blessed them person has a disease, God hasn't blessed them. They're blessed with health and they're blessed with not health, right? So we have to be careful when we say God blessed me with health, right? So sometimes cancer is the biggest blessing, right? And sometimes the saints, in fact, most of the time, the saints are the ones who get the cancer and the saints are the ones who are poor and the saints are the ones who have a hard life, right? So let's not, let's not allow ourselves to, to devolve the concept of blessing to that. But, um, okay, the Christian, of course, 
has a different understanding. It's not about excess possessions. It's not about being a blessing in that way. The Christian is, I'm going to be placed in the hands of Christ, and I'm going to bless others in my service. And so we're those five loaves, and we get placed, and when we do, each one of us feeds, uh, each loaf feeds a thousand people. It's practically infinity. And when I think about it, again, I'm nothing, but in the hands of Christ, I become something. And of course, it's very silly for me to think if any one of those one loaves of barley thought to themselves, barley loaves thought to themselves, man, I'm amazing. I just fed a thousand people, right? You'd think, you know, dear barley loaf, right? You're ridiculous, right? You're just a piece of garbage, right? You're really just, you know, you're barely one kid's meal. And if you thought you fed a thousand people, there's something wrong with you, right? So in his hands, I'm a blessing. I'm a blessing to my work, to my community, to my service, to my family, to people around me. And there are people you know who are just a blessing and you feel it everywhere they go. People smile, people are there, people love them. They, they help everywhere they go, right? And where will I be a blessing again? Did I say church? Eh. We're not really called to be a blessing in church. We're not called to be the light of the church. We're called to be the light of the world. So the church isn't the place where I shine. I don't go to bless everybody at church. They're all there. They're with Christ. They have the Eucharist. They have the, the word of God. I go, and I go be a blessing to the world. So the idea is I take from the church, I take the Eucharist, I take from the fountain of life, and then I go and I irrigate the dry world that's out there. And so Christ said, he's the light of the world. And then he said, you're the light of the world. So which is it? Who's the light of the world? Christ or me? St. Athanasius says, by analogy, God is to Christians as the sun is to the moon. I don't know how he knew this, by the way. As the sun is the exclusive source of light, so God is the sole source of glory. As the moon reflects light, so believers reflect God's glory. Right? So the, the moon is just a dead rock. right? It doesn't have light. It doesn't emit light. Right? But at night, it is the source of light. Right? And it, he, he's, he's saying that it only emits light because it reflects the light of God, the sun. And so any light we have in us, right? if the moon was to think to itself, man, I'm pretty bright. I'm amazing. Look at me. I'm lighting up the night. I'm reflecting off the ocean. I'm pretty cool. The moon's delusional. right? You're just a dead rock. You have no source in you. Right, and you have to realize that any light in me is a reflection, right? And so, in our service, people praise us, people curse us, people do all say all kinds of nice things, right? And every once in a while, like a moon, we think to ourselves, "Man, I'm pretty good," right? Until you realize all I am is a reflection. I have nothing to give. I'm dust. I'm a rock. I'm bread. And so when we get placed in the hands of Christ, we become this blessing. And look, we only get 24 hours a day. And all the saints also had 24 hours a day. Mother Teresa had 24 hours a day. Amba Brahm, the Bishop of Fayum, had 24 hours a day. And think of all the good they did in 24 hours. I imagine Amba Brahm's life as he walked around his diocese and just constantly helping, helping, helping people. Every, every interaction he got every colleague at work, every sibling, every parent, every spouse, every interaction is a blessing. And this is what we're trying to be, right, as servants. And so this is what happens when we're in Christ's hands, but the opposite is true. When we're not in Christ's hands, we become a source of anti-blessing, right? We become a curse, right? God, God forbid there's some people you know, <laughs> Everywhere they go, they cause problems. They're constantly causing fights and they're constantly doing this and they're constantly destroying that. And there's like people just have to follow them, right? And just undo all the problems that they're doing, right? There's just people like that, right? And they're outside of the hands of Christ. So the key as be to being a servant is in 
stay in the hands of Christ. Okay. And this is what St. Paul says, right? He says, I can do all things through Christ who, who strengthens me. And that's the confidence of the loaves, right? And the apostles did this and they changed the world, right? Because they were just so dependent. In fact, Jesus did a few, said a few really weird things. He said, don't take an extra money bag with you. Don't take an extra pair of sandals. Don't take a staff. Don't take anything, right? Why? Dependence on me. Okay. All right. Um, I want to I wanna point out one little, one more thing. Sometimes in our service, um, so when you think about the, 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 the five loaves and the two fish story, right? What, what happened? Okay, Jesus blessed it, right? He started breaking it, and I imagine more food occurred, right? He made them sit down in groups of 50, and all the apostles came, and each one took a basket, and they walked to their group of 50, right? And I'm sure, I'm sure some of the apostles, you know, elbowed the other one out. Like, hey, my group is really hungry. Let me go first, right? And I'm sure, and I'm pretty sure it's probably Peter, you know, he elbowed out John, and just like, yeah, you know, my group's very well fed. They're very, they love me. And every time I bring a basket, they're like, Peter, you're the best. And I'm like, he's like, I know. And when people talked about the miracle of the five loaves and the two fish, I'm sure the apostles, you know, a week later were like, yeah, you know, I did that. You know, that was, that was me. I just wanted to brought to the groups. And, and I'm sure, you know, each apostle had his own color shirt. There's the blue shirts and the yellow shirts and the red shirts, right? And they all kind of competing, right? So imagine how delusional the apostles are when they think that they actually provided the food. But yet Christ let them. He did that, right? And said, I gave it to the apostles and the apostles gave it to the people. He wanted them to give it, right? And if any one of the apostles thought to themselves, I did this, yeah, delusional, right? But I'm sure they did. I'm sure someone thought to himself, yeah. And I'm sure when he walked up and everyone thanked them for the food, it's guys are amazing. It's, I know, right? And so we do that as servants sometimes, right? We think it's me. I'm providing this great meal and everyone's like, you're amazing. So we have to be careful. And then I want to contemplate one more thing. So I imagine he broke all the food, he gave it to the apostles and the apostles gave it to the people. And there's just a lot of food. So everyone ate and was full. That's what the, Bible, that's what the gospel says, right? And so I imagine that someone ate whatever, 15 bites of food or 20 bites of food or whatever number of bites of food it takes to fill you. And then you were full. Could it be different than that? Could it be that somebody in the way back in the corner, John's group, only got one bite and was still full? Did everyone have to eat and be full the way I think a human being eats and is full? I have to have you know, 27 bites of food and then I'm full. Could someone have gotten one bite and felt full and actually been full? Could someone have gotten one bite and the food multiplied inside them? Sure. It's God. He could do whatever he wants. He just turned fed 5,000 people with us. Right? So it doesn't have to be the case that this worked the way I thought it worked. Now, obviously, we know it did, right? Because they have 12 baskets of remaining fragments, right? So there was a lot of food. But I'm sure there's one guy in the back corner who didn't get much but still felt very satisfied. So the lesson we learn here is for us. Sometimes, you know, before a talk or, you know, I, you know, you go into a difficult situation, right? You're, you're about to go visit someone in the hospital who's in a really bad situation and you don't know what to say, right? You know, someone's dying and God forbid their child or something really hard. And you stand at the door before you go in and you're like, God, give me the words, right? What, what do I say to comfort this mom? What do I say to comfort these, this spouse? And you ask God for words. And then you realize that you actually don't have to do that, right? Because when I say, God, give me the words, what am I saying? I'm saying, God, I wanna say great things so that their hearts are affected. But you can also pray, God, let them hear what they need to hear. Maybe I can say gibberish. I can say something dumb. I can make a bad joke. And they hear comfort and consolation. 
So it doesn't have to come out of me as good. They just have to receive it as good. The food, there doesn't have to be a lot of food. I just, when I eat whatever I get, I get I'm satisfied. Right? And so sometimes our prayers before a lesson is, you know, let me say the right thing. Let me do the right thing. Let me, but maybe the prayer is let them hear the right thing. Right. And sometimes, you know, God in his grace humbles me. I'll give a talk and someone will walk up to me. That's a great talk. I really like the point about blah, blah, blah. And I think to myself, I never said that. <laughs> right, I'm 99, like I know. And, and, and I'm just thinking, and then, and then they go on. And I'm just like, okay, I know I didn't say that because I never even thought that. Like, I didn't even have that thought. Like, what you're saying is a revelation to me. That's a really good point. I didn't make that. Right? And God, it's like, he's, God reveals to me, like, listen, bro, it's not your words. You just, you just, you just do this. And I move the hearts, right? People sitting there, I move their hearts. I'm doing the work. You're just the mouthpiece. Don't forget. And that's a blessing that, he real, that I realize that I'm blessing. He's blessing from the inside. Okay. So first thing is I'm in the hands of Christ. I'm a blessing, not a material blessing, but a spiritual blessing. And the blessing doesn't have to be external. It could be internal. Now comes the next part. What did he do? What did Christ do with the bread? When they, when the kid, they took it from the kid, they take it from the kid, the kid offered it, and they gave it to Christ. What did he do? Braid. Braid. Did something else. He broke it. He broke it. And so the person who gets placed in the hands of Christ, we just agreed we have to be placed in the hands of Christ. What's Christ going to do to you? He's going to break you. And that has to happen. Because you can't distribute a whole loaf. Right? If you have a whole loaf that's just all content and, and perfect and round and complete, right? Does that feeds one person. And so if you want to feed 10 people, you got to be broken 10 times. You want to feed a thousand people, you're going to be broken a thousand times. And this is what God does. When we say, I place myself into your hands, that sounds really good. That's lovely. But I'll tell you what Christ is going to do. And that has to happen. And that's what service is. So a very important point, part of service is being broken in the hands of Christ. And letting him break me. Because that is a choice that you have to make. He won't break you without your consent. And he may try and you just may fight back. And say, no, not like that. And we do this, right, in our spiritual lives. We, have, we make up these principles, right, where we say, you know, I'll forgive them one time. But she's done it to me three times now and I don't forgive more than twice. What is that? That's putting conditions on God. You say, this is how you have to break me. Like this. Just one time on this seam, and that's it. And we like to tell God conditions on how we like to be broken. But that's actually not a choice we get to make. Once you decide to place your hands in the life of Christ, you have to expect that he will break you the way you need to be broken so that he can distribute you to the most people. And that isn't our choice. God does that. And FYI, it hurts. It sucks. Because that's where our ego gets crushed. That's where our self-will gets crushed. That's when I want the service to look like this and it doesn't, happens. And I want this person to act like that and they don't, happens. And this is what God is trying to do to us in the service. And in fact, this is the only blessing of the service, right? I mean, we, we all remember that we don't remember anything the Sunday school teacher told us growing up, right? You all remember that, right? So you can do all the uh, run around and do all the things and no one remembers. But they, you remember that one servant, right, who loved. That's all you remember. And the reason you remember the one servant who loved is that one servant was broken and wasn't selfish. And the light of Christ, the moon that they are, it was reflecting Christ. And the only way the moon reflects Christ 
is that the moon doesn't have its own will. Right? The moon says, I want to reflect God like this. I want to be over here. No, it doesn't work that way. And so as people, we love ourselves. We love people to do the right things to us. We love people to respect us, to treat us respectfully, to treat us with dignity, to treat us and say, you know, honor our positions and say, you know, you guys are smart and you're, you know, I like the way you're doing things and give us compliments, but that's not the way it works. And certainly that's not the way service works. And, and sometimes ulterior motives can get involved in the service, right? I mean, you all have kids, right? So that's an ulterior motive, right? Many of us serve our kids. Many of us serve the ages of our kids. Many of us want to make sure the kid, there's lots of activities for our kids. What about others' kids? What happens 15 years from now? When your kids are older, are you going to be serving the little uh, four and five and six-year-olds anymore? Are you going to want to invest in someone else's kids, in someone else's church, in someone else's youth group? Ulterior motives. So we all have these ulterior motives, right? We want to make sure the kid, our kids have a good time, that they get connected to the church. We want to make sure our kids are included. We want to make sure our kids aren't excluded. We want to make sure our kids are in the right group. And we want to make sure that they, you know, marry the right person. They don't do drugs and they don't go and they go to medical school and they do all the right things that they're supposed to do. Is that bringing them to the kingdom of God? Or is that the kingdom of birth? Is that the material blessings? What are we really looking for? And so these are the things that we have to purify ourselves. And don't worry, God will help you. <laughs> to purify sort of why we do what we do, right? And, and we start to think about why am I serving? And who am I serving? And am I just serving me, right? And if I'm just serving me, then is my service in the hands of Christ? Or is it in my hands, right? And when someone says, hey, you know what? I know you're serving your... You know, the junior high, that's where your kid is, but can you serve, you know, the college group? You're like, no, I want to serve the junior high. That's where my kids are. And I want to make sure they're having a good time. And I want to make sure they're included. And I want to make sure they're doing all the right things. And I make sure that dumb servant over there isn't doing it because she doesn't know what she's doing, right? So you can tell I speak from experience. <laughs> Saint, uh, Father Matthew, the poor, one of my favorites, he says, walk cautiously, patiently, humbly. Know that God, this is hard to hear, know that God is at work to destroy the false you and revive the image of God who is the real you. This will not happen without your permission. You can choose to be the false you the rest of your miserable life. And it is a miserable life to be false. But I love this part where he says, God is at work to destroy the false you. And another place in, the, in this book, uh, Grain of Weed, he talks about all the things that God sends to destroy the old man, right? That selfish guy. And one of the things he says is like, you know, he sends us in-laws, they break us, they send us kids, they kill us, they send us, you know, even hunger. And then he said insects. And I was like, insects? Mosquitoes. <laughs> and I'm thinking, my God, he's in the monastery. You guys been to monasteries, right? Like you can't handle one day in the monastery. The mosquitoes are all over you, right? And you're like, I can't wait to get back home. And these guys live with the mosquitoes. And I thought to myself, my God, he sees the mosquitoes biting him, you know, the, you know, in the middle of the night, pisses you off, right? Chew at it, you can never hit it. And he saw that as God humbling him. God sent me the mosquito to break that part of me that hates mosquitoes. It's amazing. Right? I mean, you ever you watch these like documentaries on kids in Africa or whatever, or when you go to Africa and you see flies landing on people's faces, right? And you just chew, like you're just like immediate instinct, right? And the person in front of you isn't chewing. They're just letting the flies land on them. He insists in doing that. Yeah, they can. He insists that to sit down and on let, the bathroom yeah. where it is bad smell and a lot of And let the flies land on them. Yes. What's happened? The part of them that doesn't like flies landing on their face is dead. They let it die. In fact, they killed it. So there's a part of me that when someone says something, you get a reaction. 
I'll tell you guys a story. There's a, there's a guy named Abbott Trufon. He's in Seattle in an uh, island called Bashan Island. I highly recommend you go see him. Uh, he's like a big, he's a convert, a big white guy with a huge beard. Looks like Santa Claus. And um, he's amazing. If anyone's read his, read his book, he has a blog, a daily blog. He's on Facebook. He's Abbott Trufon. He's really, he just writes his one page things are really beautiful spiritual meditations. He's a very deep guy. Anyway, so he was at Starbucks. He walks into Starbucks, gets his coffee, he sits down, and these two guys, you know, Seattle's pretty liberal and atheist. These two guys are sitting like right next to him. So he's like here, and these two guys are like right here, young guys, 20s. And they one guy says to the other guy, you know, only a stupid old man would believe in God. Right? He says it pretty loud, and he's right next to him. Right? So I have a tree fun, just you know, doesn't react, drinks his coffee. And then he waits a little bit, then he goes up to the cashier and he says, I want you to do me a favor. I'd like to buy two gift cards and I want you to give it to those gentlemen over there. But I want you to wait five minutes after I leave before you give it to him. She said, okay. So he bought the two gift cards, he left. He said like three or four months later, he's back. He happens to be by the Starbucks, he swings in and he sees those two guys sitting there. So he walks in, they immediately walk up to him. And they said, we wanna ask you a question. Why did you buy us those gift cards? And he said, my God is a God of love. And that's what we do. We return love for evil. And the, the, the guy, the mean guy who said only a stupid old man would believe in God, he starts crying. And he starts talking to him for three hours about his life and his problems. And Abbot Trifon comforts him and helps him out and talks with him and all that good stuff. But the important point of the story is when they said, only a stupid old man would believe in God. What was his reaction? He didn't have one. Now, I can tell you, if I would have had one, I would have looked at him and said, you want to go, bro? <laughs> or ask, you know how much I bench? I mean, I would have like said, you know what? You piece of garbage, punk kids, kids, he's in. I would have just went off, right? Just realistically, okay? Maybe if I wasn't wearing this, but I mean, you know. <laughs> So why didn't he go off? Why didn't Abbot Trifon go off like I would have? Because the part of him that would go off, that angry part, he killed it. He killed it, and so he didn't react. He was able to absorb the ugliness of man and respond with love. Remind you of anyone? Absorb the ugliness of man and respond with Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so there's a quote, I don't know if I ever told you guys this quote, it's on the, the wall of a monastery in Greece. It says, if we die before we die, then we won't die when we die. You guys heard this one? If we die before we die, then we don't die when we die. And so life is about dying. Life is about dying to the selfishness, to the ego, to the pride, to the anger, to the emotions, to the lust, to this, you know, that, that reaction, right? When she does this, what's your reaction? When he does this, what's my reaction? Right? So this is what Christ does. He breaks us and he lets the service break us and he lets things not go our way. And that's okay. And you're supposed to just sit in it. Like, yeah. This did not go your way. This other servant overruled you. A woman overruled you. The bishop overruled you. That's absolutely correct. Now sit in it and learn to live in it. And let the part of you that's like, well, these people are idiots and they don't know what they're doing. And I do. Let that part die. Kill it. And this is, this is the, the story of the five loaves and the two fish. And when we do that, when we let Jesus break us, he distributes us. And the more we're broken, the more we get distributed. Right? The more pieces we're in, the more impactful our service is. So the, the legends, right? The Abunam Shui Kamils and the Pope, broken. There is no ego in them. There is no trace of the old man. They've broken it. They've killed it. Right? And that's the, the point of the service. I can just stop now. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Or How can we do that? What practical 
you can do it with fasting, but to us, what do we do? So, you know, Jesus says, I stand at the door knocking and you have to open the door. So when a trial comes to me, and actually this, this, um, this just occurred to me like a month ago, I was reading about the, the I was preparing for a talk on the Paul Seed Man, the 38 years of last week. And the, the saint was saying there's a very big difference between the action of a person, which is their free will, and the situation that occurs as a result of this person. Okay. So someone, I'll give you an example. Someone at work slanders you, lies about you. Okay. Says something, you know, they didn't do this, blah, 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 just to cover themselves. Now that person is lying. They have a free will. They can choose to lie. And they're judged according to their lie. And that's between them and their God. But then he says the situation that arises from that slandering. Now all of a sudden, boss is looking at you. You might get fired for some evil. He says that situation you take from the hand of God. And you allow it to happen. And you say this happened for a reason. And I will accept it as if it's from the hand of God himself. And I assent to it. Right? I agree and I allow myself to endure it patiently. Right? We see this in like the life of like Pope Carillos, right? We read about these priests who are against Pope Carillos and they would like to say all this mean stuff about him. And instead of uh, arguing with them, he would assent to it. He'd say, I'm going to take it. They're like, you know, you could stop that. No, I won't. I'm going to accept what they're doing as if from God, right? And he allowed it to happen and he didn't question the person. And so sometimes what we do is we mix the two things, right? The person and the issue. We see an evil person doing an evil thing and we say, this must be an evil outcome. And that's a mistake. I'll give you another example. Who crucified Jesus? Bunch of people. Was it was it God's will that Jesus be crucified? Sure, but I think it's the chief priest's will, Judas's will, the scribes, Pharisees' will. Who did it? Did God do it, or did the chief priest do it? So, the chief priests, in their own free will, with their own decision, chose to do what they did even layered a false accusation against him. He's, he's going against the Roman Empire. you got to kill this guy. That's their choice. Now, Jesus could have said, you know what? This whole cross thing, it's coming from those people. I know those people are not good. Those people are liars. Those people are evil. This is not God's will. I will not accept it. This is stuff we do all the time. We look at the person and we say, that person's no good. That person, that's a lie. That person isn't acting in my best interest. So I don't accept the situation. And what this saint is saying is you have to break the person from the situation. Person can be evil. In fact, most of us are. Right? But Jesus then said, Lord, you can, and he spoke to his father. He said, Father, and this is an interesting thing. He says, you can do all things. All things are possible with you. What does that mean? You could stop this, but not your will. And not my will, but your will. He says, remove this chalice from me. Like, I'm not interested. This kind of, it's going to hurt. But thy will and not my will. So he took the crucifixion from the hand of the father immediately without questions asked. So sometimes in the service in life, something bad happens. Like to Pope Carlos and to Jesus and to whoever. And we say, that person's evil. This is no good. But what he says is you have to separate. The situation, we assent to it. And so the way, the practical way we do this is when something comes to us, we take it from the hand of God. And we allow it to do what God wants it to do in us without fighting back. And in fact, this is what Abuna Mehta says. He says, this will not happen without your permission. Right? You can choose not to to do it. Any other questions? I have one poem I was going to read to you and then I'm, I'm done. So I think I should ask questions. Yes. Is there a marker for, for like that part of you being dead or is it just like a new notice? Or is there like a marker for feeling like 
positive ideas now coming from the people? Don't, don't, don't look for an outcome. Trust the process, right? So it's like working out, right? Don't look for results. Love, fall in love with the process, right? And then the results come, right? So don't, don't, don't like, well, you know, how spiritual am I? You know, I, I wonder if I, you know, I, last year I would have gotten, but this year I didn't. So I, yeah, don't do that. Right? You just do the right thing. You know, just, just, you know, put on blinders and you're not even looking at, you know, five seconds ahead or five seconds behind. Just right now, just do the right thing. Just do the right thing. Just do the right thing. You know, but this guy has done this five, just do the right thing, right? Focus. So, and as far as progress, okay? <laughs> you make progress the worse you feel, right? So uh, let's go back to working out. There should be no workout, right? Where you feel good, right? So if you have a coach, coach says, I want you to run this stairs, right? You run the stairs and at the end you're like, coach, that was easy. Man, that was a great workout. What's coach gonna do tomorrow, right? You ain't, you're, you're not doing the same workout, right? Because it wasn't a workout. If you say it's easy, it's not a workout, right? So by definition, every time one of these trials comes to us, it has to hurt. Otherwise, it's not a cross, right? So you always feel terrible, right? You always feel pushed. Like every workout, you feel pushed. Same with school, right? If, you, if my kid comes home in fifth grade and they're doing math, like, dad, this math is so easy. We learned this in fourth grade. I'm like, well, then you're not in school. You're not learning. Right? I'm going to have a talk with your teacher because you shouldn't be covering fourth grade material in fifth grade, right? And it, you shouldn't be excited that it's easy, right? It should hurt your head, right? When your kid's struggling, like, you know, I'm, I'm getting it, but it's really hard. Perfect. That's where I want you. And fourth grade, I want you at that level. And in fifth grade, I want you at that level. And sixth grade, I want you at that level. And seventh grade, I want you. And I don't want it to ever feel easy or too hard. I want you right there in the middle all the time. Struggle and get it. Struggle and get it. Struggle. And the spiritual life is exactly like that. You never reach a grade where you're like, yeah, I'm in ninth grade now and I know it all. That should never happen. Good question. Yeah. Did you say that you actually have 91? I don't remember. So at what point do you kind of become, I don't want to say like com com complacent and like what's happening to me, but is there something to be said about at least having some active role in, in what's happening around you as, a, like as, a, as opposed to it's just happening to you? Does that make sense? Like not... Um, Are you taking the bedroom? Not, not that, because I feel like even that can kind of be a, be a little like superficial if you feel like you're being a doormat, and then again, like you're you're still now thinking of yourself, like what was me. So not even in that sense, but in a sense of like having an active role in in, in what's actually happening in your life, as opposed to you're just kind of like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like yeah, you I get know. to an extreme where you're like, oh, I don't care, yeah, like, yeah. it's great, kind of goddess, but like, and it's you're just kind of being, yeah. And then, there's something to be said about you know well, there's still like I get that I exhaustion get that. mental toll on you and, and not just being taking an active role in, in how you're living your life going forward and, and how it affects other people around you. Okay, yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. Um so how do I say this? Um I think as as especially as a parent. Right, and as a spouse and as a servant, um, sometimes we kind of like, you know, like, you know, I, I'm not just gonna sit around and you know wait for God to reveal His will for my kids, right? Do I, you know, I put them in karate or not, right? So there, there's there are those decisions, right, that we that we have to make, and of course, as a parent, we're always taking a very active role in our kids' development, and and but I want to warn all of you, you know, a lot of young parents here and you know hopefully the older parents will back me is that you don't want to get like too drawn into your ability to control a situation like control is a is really a figment of your imagination right and 
life has a way of revealing to you that you really aren't in control of a lot of things. And then you realize that, you know, God was. And God, you know, and, and that faith, I think you have to develop over time, right? So um, I think, think I'm answering your question. So, and, and I mean, we, we call Christ, we say he's the Pantocrator, right? What does that mean? Like, what does the word Pantocrator mean? Pan means all, like, you know, like Pan American games, all, right? Tokrator comes from the, the Greek word for ocracy or like, you know, like democracy is control of the people. So ocracy is like control or governing or authority, right? In Arabic, it's much better, right? He, 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 he arranges everything. Right, and so we have the icon of of Punto Kratur is Jesus holding the, the the world, right? Like we teach the kids, he's got the whole world in his hands, you know. And we have to. That's actually the, the the truth, right? So sometimes we as parents we get a little hung up on how much we can influence and how much we can do, and I'm gonna, you know, my kid isn't gonna blah blah blah, and then God very gently rips that kid out of your hand, right? And says, you know what? You're not in nearly as much control as you thought. And this usually happens in the teenage years <laughs> when they very violently break from you, right? And they're, you know, they say all the things that you don't want to hear that you said to your parents. And then your parents say, your parents have shuffled, shuffled a bit. Right, so um, <laughs> that's what I got. Anyway, so uh, some sympathy would have been nicer, but you know, right, right. right. Um, <laughs> what am I saying? Anyway, so I don't know if I answered any of your questions, but like, um, you know, I think that there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a balance, but I would err on the side of letting God control and, and let him just, let decisions happen, right? And you'd be amazed how well things go. I'm getting some yeses from the old people, so I know I'm, I'm doing the right thing. Yes. <laughs> So we don't so, die at once, we die the ego inside us. So so the so, so the the there's two separate things going on. First thing is wait, I'm way out of my you know pay grade here, right? So I mean I can tell you what I think and be excommunicated tomorrow, but I'm not going through it, right? <laughs> so um but I just revealed to you what I think, didn't I? Okay. So um <laughs> The more important point is, is uh, he, he got, he got what I said. I'm going to be screaming this this week. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the least of my problems. <laughs> um, I think people, some, uh, people bring me in just like, he's going to say stuff and it's just gonna, he's going to go off the rails at some point. Um, but there's a big difference, a huge difference and extremely important difference between what I just said and what you just said, okay? And I'm, I want to go to, it's an infinitely different difference, okay? Long, 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 long services and long, 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 long hymns in order to kill us, that's not what I'm talking about, okay? At all. But I mean, also, like, the aspect of, like, you know, what, like, I said, I'm going to have, like, wake up early, read your day, all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. That, that also is, 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 that also is not, so... Go back to working out. Okay. <laughs> so when you when you when you go to the gym, okay, and you uh some guy next to you is lifting you know 30 pound dumbbell, 40 pound dumbbell, and he's got huge arms, and you just ah, right, and you go, Yeah, I'm gonna do I'm gonna look like him, right? So I take up a half pound dumbbell, okay, and I do this, right? I'm like, Jeez, this is so fantastic, right? The reason it's fantastic is I'm not getting any better, okay. Something like fasting, for example. Fasting is not 
a thing. Fasting is exercise. It's a muscle, right? And I'm working the muscle for the actual thing. You know, when, when, a, when a running back goes into the gym and he does squats, okay? Squats is not what wins football games. Touchdowns win football games, right? The squats are not the objective, right? You know, push 5,000 pounds of meat through the goal line, that's the objective, okay? So sometimes we mix up the, the thing with the objective, right? What are we really trying to achieve? And sometimes those things become the things that we try to achieve, you know? I, I was listening to a sermon by Abunadud Lamai, and he, was, he made this wonderful point. He said a, a youth came up to him, scandalized, and said, I was reading Matthew 25, and now I have doubted the entire church. He's like, what happened? And he said, it says, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was in prison and you visited me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you, you visited me. <clears throat> okay, and he goes, where's this beha? Where's fasting? Where's prayer? Where's communion? Where's confession? Where's reading the Bible? Where's all the things, you know, the five things we learn in Sunday school, fast, pray, read the Bible, blah, right? Where are those things? They're not on the list. And he's scandalized. Because he thought his religion was, I do the things. I fast, I pray, I read the Bible, blah, blah. That's not the list. The real list is I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was in prison, I was sick. That's the list, right? And again, prison and, and hungry and thirsty and sick isn't in prison, right? There are people in prison in their own minds, right? Just, you know, everyone has issues, right? There's people sick all around us. So that's the list, right? That's the thing we're supposed to do. We get caught up in the things that get us there, right? So fasting isn't a thing. That strengthens my, my will, my ability to restrain myself, right? And you know, I mean, like, I'm just going to take fasting as an example, right? I mean, you know, in life, right, life is full of sucky things, right? So, you know, I wanted to have this job, but I got that job, right? And I wanted to have this kind of husband, but I got that kind of husband, right? And I want to have these kind of kids, but I got those kids. And I want to have these kind of in-laws, but I got those in-laws. And I want to have this kind of a boon, I got that kind of a boon. I wanted to have this kind of boss, but I got that kind of boss. Life is full of this, right? A lot of disappointment. Okay. And then the church, Christianity really is at, the, at that, is that, that's the point, right? When, when I wanted this kind of husband, but I got that husband, right? Now that's, that's where Christianity exists, okay? That's the fight, right? That's the fight we all have, okay? Or this, I wanted this kind of friend, but I got that kind of friend. And so the, and that's the important fight, right? So then the church tries to train us for that fight and says, okay, at a very baby, baby, baby level, we're going to train that muscle with food. I want that kind of food, but I'm going to have this food, right? And the church is trying to train the muscle of like, you're not going to get what you want now, right? And you're going to be okay with it. And it starts with food, and that's just the easy thing. But it's not, that's not the objective. It's not the tamaya, right? The objective is when it really counts, right? And I have the, the, the wife that I didn't want all of a sudden in front of me that I love, right? Or the in-law or the boss or the whatever that I love, right? That I accept, that I'm okay with that, right? So sometimes we can get, and the church is, you know, it's easy to confuse, right? You gotta say these prayers, we gotta do these things, blah, 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 blah. and we, we think those are the things. They're not the things, they lead to the things, right? And it's very important we break that concept, right? So when I say die to myself, I don't, that doesn't mean long services. Right. And sometimes it's couched as a long service, like, well, you know, I mean, Jesus said, you know, you have to die to yourself. It's like, nah, you know, no, that's not what he's talking about. You know, he's talking about the way you treated that other deacon this morning. That's actually what he's talking about, right? When the other deacon said the thing that you didn't want to say and then you shut him down, that's actually the thing he's talking about, not this. Right. And we confuse those two. I'll just get, 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 get excommunicated at some point. It's a matter of time. It's okay. Go ahead on. Any other questions that I'll excommunicate? I'll read you this, this poem and then we can end. I know I've gone over time. Sorry. No, sorry. 
Um, and, and this, I think, poem kind of captures uh, the sentiment. And the poem is called, This Was From Me. Have you ever thought that everything concerns you concerns me also? You are precious in my eyes and I love you. For this reason, it is a special joy for me to train you. When temptations and the evil one come upon you like a river, I want you to know that this was from me. I want you to know that when you're in difficult conditions among people who do not understand you and cast you away, this was from me. I am your God and the circumstances of your life are in my hands. You do not end up in your position by chance. This is precisely the position I have appointed for you. Weren't you asking me to teach you humility? And there, I placed you precisely in the school where they teach this lesson. Your environment and those cruel people around you are performing my will. Know that this was from me. Have you ever spent the night in suffering? Are you separated from your relatives and those you love? Did you have a friend or someone to whom you opened your heart deceive you? This was from me. I allowed this frustration to touch you so that you would learn that your best friend is the Lord. I want you to bring everything to me and tell me everything. Did someone slander you? I will make your righteousness shine like light and your life like the midday moon. Were your plans destroyed? Your soul yielded and you were exhausted? This was from me. Unexpected failures found you and despair overcame your heart, but no, that this was from me. Serious illness found you, which may be healed or may be incurable, and has nailed you to your bed. This was from me. Because I want you to know, I want you to know me more deeply through physical ailment. Do not murmur against the trial I have sent you, and do not try to understand my plan for the salvation of people's souls, but murmur, mur, unmurmur, murmuringly and humbly. Bow your head before my goodness. You're dreaming about doing something special for me. Instead of doing it, you fell into a bed of pain. This was from me. I'll just stop there. I'll end with this one. Um, remember always that every difficulty you come across, every offensive word, every slander and criticism, every obstacle to your work, which could cause frustration and disappointment, this is from me. No, remember always, no matter where you are, that whatsoever hurts will be dulled as soon as you learn that in all things to look at me. Everything has been sent to you by me for the perfection of your souls. All these things were from me. Glory be to God.